So today I want to talk about genetics, classical genetics specifically. When we think about genetics, we always think about DNA, but this idea of DNA and how it works was not always known. That we know your genes lead to your characteristics. The classical genetics is the study of phenotypes, because in olden times, in classical times, uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, the uh, idea of how DNA worked was not necessarily apparent to everyone. That they could instead study the characteristics of organisms instead. That modern genetics allows us to understand the underlying mechanisms of the DNA itself. This should be obvious to everyone, that if you look at organisms for any length of time, we find that Offspring resemble their parents. They share certain traits, be it humans or giraffes or this green pigeon from Southeast Asia or this tiger or this pangolin. The study of genetics was first systematically carried out by this fellow, Gregor Mendel, who was a monk who lived in Austria in the 19th century. He's considered the father of modern genetics. He studied the inheritance of characteristics in pea plants, which are a useful organism because they have only a few chromosomes, and their traits are relatively easy to see and study. He's famous enough that Google even did a doodle for him for his 179th birthday a few years ago. Previously, people thought that traits blended from both parents, that their offspring had a combination of the two, which we can illustrate here by looking at how green, I'm sorry, blue and yellow mix to create green that if this were the case, then this black chicken and this white rooster should make gray offspring, which they do. But when these gray offspring are mated with others in their generation, we find that you get a whole mess of different characteristics that clearly means that these traits don't actually blend necessarily as easily as we imagine them to. And this is what Mendel did, not with chickens, but with pea plants. His plants were true breeding. What this means is they had, uh, the through the process of self-pollination, uh, the preservation of certain traits. That These plants were mated with themselves, where the pollen were transferred to the stigma and uh, then fertilized the gametes, the ovules inside, so that you got the same characteristics generation after generation. This made the plants homozygous, as we will see. The traits he studied included seed color, seed shape, seed coat color, pod color, pod shape, stem length, and flower position. These traits were useful because they were easy to see, certainly with the colors, and as well, they came in two forms. There was nothing in between these two extremes. This made them easy to actually trace through the generations. To actually control the breeding of these plants, Mendel first cuts off the structures that produced pollen inside each of the flowers. Then he brushed pollen from one particular plant to another. That way he could control their reproduction. And then you plant those uh, seeds that result, those peas, and uh, grow those uh, offspring to find their traits. So, the first generation would have all been the true breeding plants. That when they were self-fertilized, gave rise to identical looking offspring. Then you mate these with others, cross-pollination, cross-fertilization as it's called, and you get a group of flowers in the second generation. These are then mated with each other, or they are self-fertilized, and you get different characteristics. Here we already begin to see that these traits of flower color, white and purple, don't blend in the offspring. These offspring are still all purple. There is no light purple or pink color appearing here. These are the traits that Mendel studied. Just some vocab to get out of the way. This first generation is referred to as the parental generation. The F stands for filial or offspring, that the first generation would have been the F1, the next would be the F2, then the F3, etc. Based on this, Mendel developed his first law that certain traits seem to be dominant over others, that here the round and wrinkled seed colors are not equal, that in the offspring of these two plants, all of the uh, traits are round only, that certain traits, yellow and gray seed coat, uh, the smooth uh, pod shape, the green pod color, the axial flower position, and the tall plant height were the dominant traits, and their alleles, or uh, particular varieties or forms of a gene, were 
dominant over those that were recessive. If we look at flower color specifically, we can see that all of the F1, the first generation of flowers, are purple. When you mate them with others or you self-fertilize them, what you get are, is this very characteristic ratio, three to one, of dominant to recessive traits. What Mendel concluded based on this is that each of these traits must be determined by two alleles, one from each pair. That this, if we refer to these alleles using the letter P, one of these alleles is the uppercase P, one is the lowercase, the uppercase being the dominant, the lowercase being the recessive. If you had the parents, therefore, having the two uppercase P for the purple, and two lowercase for the white, you get offspring which have one of these uppercase and one of these lowercase, this uh, down here. That if you have two of these dominant alleles, you have the dominant phenotype. And two, if you have one of the dominant and one of the recessive, you still have the dominant phenotype. The only way to have this recessive white phenotype is to have two of these recessive alleles. If you have two of the same alleles, this is said to be a homozygote, that to be homozygous is to have two of the same allele. Both of these plants are homozygotes. If we have two different alleles, this plant is said to be a heterozygote. To be heterozygous is to have two different alleles. Down here then, we see that these plants have a combination of alleles because these plants and their alleles are coming together with those from another plant to create this different, uh, these different combinations in the F2 generation. Let's see how this works. Again, homozygous parents, big P, big P, little P, little P for the white. In the F1, all heterozygotes. But when we consider the mating that occurs in the F1, what we find is that uh, the gametes from each plant have half as much DNA as you began with. So they, half of the gametes have the uppercase P, half of them have the lowercase. And the same for the other plant. When these gametes come together in this Punnett square, what we can see is that three of the resulting plants have the dominant phenotype, and only a, one of the four has the recessive one, which explains very nicely the results that we get here. Note that we can't actually tell which of these plants has which genotype. We are just guessing that uh, the heterozygote and the homozygote dominant are masked by uh, the phenotype itself. We find the same kind of pattern of the 3 to 1 ratio when we look at all of Mendel's traits in pea plants, that the dominant yellow is what we find in the F1 when these plants are mated with each other. You get the 3 to 1 dominant to recessive uh, ratio in the F2 as well. The reasoning here is that you begin with uh, these two extremes. The, uh, this is the dominant, this is the recessive. You get the heterozygous in the F1, all yellow. And when you mate them with each other, using a Punnett square, we can find that these gametes, which contain either this one or this allele, can come together to create this 3 to 1 ratio of yellow to green. And this applies across all of his data, that Mendel found a 3 to 1 ratio when he mated together plants with different traits and then mated their offspring with each other. Again, note the F2 shows a 3 to 1 ratio. Based on his results, Mendel came up with a second law. He found that the trait uh, for, let's say, flower color had two alleles, and these alleles must separate when the offspring, uh, when this organism forms gametes. If we look at the F1, for example, this is heterozygous, the only way for this plant mating with itself or with others to get this is for this little P allele to come apart from the other one and come together with another little P allele. That the law of segregation is explained between the F1 and F2 by the appearance of this, the recessive phenotype. The reason it works as well in the language of modern genetics is when we think about uh, homologous chromosomes. We know chromosomes come in pairs, that the alleles for a particular trait will be found on both chromosomes. The combination of these two will give rise to your trait. If you have two of the uh, same ones, you are homozygous. If you have two different ones, you are heterozygous. But your gametes are going to have only one or the other of the two chromosomes and not both. 
a locus, by the way, is just the location of this gene on the chromosome. So if you get this chromosome, you get all of these alleles with it. Mendel's third law is that of independent assortment. And what that says is that these two chromosomes are sorted into gametes completely independently of these two. That you might get these two splitting down the middle, so you get big A, big B in one gamete, little a, little b in the other gametes. Or you might have these two being flipped, that you get big A, little b in one gamete, and little a, big b in the other gamete. All of these possibilities are equally likely and should all be considered when we think about a Punnett square. What we're looking at is Mendel's peas again. Here we're looking at not just one trait, but two. Here we're looking at seed color and seed appearance. That The seeds here are yellow and round, and here they're green and wrinkled. They give rise to heterozygous offspring, which have the yellow round seeds, but they are big R, little r, big Y, little y in genotype. When these are mated with each other, the gametes have half as much DNA, so they have one of the two R's, either big R or little r, and one of the two Y's, either big Y or little y. That as a result, when you put these together, you get this entire mess of different phenotypes. And what we should point out is that some of these are very unlike the ones you started with. This round and green, for example, is not found anywhere before. Neither is this yellow and wrinkle. You get this very characteristic 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio of dominant-dominant, dominant-recessive, recessive-dominant, and recessive-recessive traits. The reason this works in the language of modern genetics is to consider that in metaphase of meiosis, you get a flip between these two chromosomes, that both of these combinations are equally likely, and as a result, you get different combinations of these alleles in the gametes that form. So, in summary, the process of genetics can be understood by applying Mendel's laws, the law of dominance, that certain alleles may mask other recessive ones, that the law of segregation, that uh, the two alleles for a trait uh, separate during the process of making gametes in meiosis, and the law of independent assortment, that the alleles for different traits are, pro are sorted into gametes completely independently of each other.